ourselves today in the Gospel of Matthew, the 21st chapter, the 33rd verse through the 46th verse, Jesus again teaching by means of a parable known as the parable of the tenants. Hear these words. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent, another, then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard, and they killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to the tenants? They replied, He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied. And he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Ever equipping God as I speak, may you increase and I decrease. May the words of this message be seeds that rest in our hearts, that we may bear fruit for you here on earth. Now be bold and courageous in speaking what it is you've given me to speak. And may we as your people have ears that hear. This is our prayer in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. There's just something about this time of year. Sitting on my back patio overlooking my neighbor's pond, there's a creek that runs behind and it's full of trees. And you know what I see? The change. It's very subtle, but it's happening. The change is coming, the leaves are turning, the yellows are starting to show, some of the pretty reds are starting to show, and it's starting to happen. The year is ending. The leaves will fall. The harvest will be done. And what do we have to reflect upon? It? As I look and I see at those leaves and those changes that are coming on, it makes me think back upon what has this year produced? What, what in your life has this year produced? What has it been like? Where are you with God? What is going on in your life? I can't help but every fall sit back and think. What's been most important to you? What have, what have you put your energy to? As the leaves fall to the ground, what dreams of yours have died? And what have sustained themselves? What relationships have gone and passed and what has been built new? What have you done to make a difference in the world? But most importantly, what I think about when I think of those things is where does that come from? What has been your motivation for this year? It's something to think about. Because whether you like it or not, we all have harvest in our life. The seeds we plant, they become fruit in people's lives. Whether it be good seeds or whether it be bad seeds. If we're negative, we produce bad fruit. If we're positive, we produce good fruit. And it all depends in our lives where that comes from. Where do you draw your identity from? 
What do you stand upon that says this is who I am? Now I'm going to tell you I've been grieving all week. My friend was my mentor. And there was not a question in his life about where he stood. I was a young pastor and he took me into that town and he put his arm around me and he escorted me around the ministerial alliance and into his church. And he was just a deep man of faith. And that was 15 years ago, 20 years ago. He was this awesome man of faith and it never wavered. It never, every seed he sowed, it was because he knew where he stood. He knew where he stood. He stood on a cornerstone. Jesus refers in the scripture today, when we're talking about the parable of the tenants, about a cornerstone that's in our lives. The cornerstone is that stone, if you don't know masonry work, is that stone that set that gives direction for all that is about to be created. Every angle of the building, every angle of the structure is formed and shaped from the very essence of that cornerstone. Everything is measured from it. Everything is built upon it. It's measured from that cornerstone. For we have to ask ourselves, and Jesus is asking the scribes and the, I mean, the chief priests and the Pharisees, what is your cornerstone? Where is it that you believe? What do you believe? Who is designing your life? What kingdom are you designing in your life? And from what are you designing? Where do you stand? What's your cornerstone? What's your witness to the world? What are the seeds you are planting? The landowner built a vineyard, put a wall around it, put a tower in it, and, and began to produce crops. We all have lives. God gives us a vineyard of life to, to build relationships. He puts us in places to share the word, to, to express love, to be who it is he's created us to be. And it's our decision how we treat the vineyard. It's our decision on what we do with what God gives us in our lives. He says, go into the vineyard and work the vineyard. And the time will come when I'll take my share. Go into the vineyard and work in the vineyard. And then he sends, I love how Jesus tells the story. He sends his slaves. Now today, slaves is not a good term, okay? Just especially when we're dealing with all the racism issues and all. But in biblical times, slave was a common way of life. But it also meant someone who was looked down upon, someone other people stood upon to better themselves. And Jesus picks the lowliest of the lowlies to represent the prophets. That's who he's talking about. And he's speaking to the ancient church. He's speaking to ancient Jerusalem. And he's saying to them, guys, God established a kingdom. He planted a vineyard. And he gave it to you to care for. He's specifically speaking to the chief priests and the Pharisees. And then he sent prophets to you to tell you about what was about to happen. What was going to emerge from the cornerstone. And he wanted back from you a relationship. And you killed the messenger. You didn't listen to the prophets. And so God had mercy on you. God had mercy on you and he sent more prophets into your life. Have you ever read the Old Testament? It's prophet after prophet after prophet after prophet trying to talk to an ancient church and let them know that God is real and that their God loves them and wants relationship with them and that they are not in, the words of the Old Testament speak to us today. We are not in control. God is. And God wants to be in a love relationship with us. And God is sending us the cornerstone of our life to build that relationship on. And they killed the second set of servants. Killed them. This week I reflected about my conversations with my friend. And I wonder if I really heard what he said to me. 
I wonder, I sat on that back porch and I watched those leaves fall and, and I wonder what words he said to me that I didn't listen to. Because I was young, I was young, I, you know, full of energy, ready to go, hard charging, live life to its fullest, preach the gospel, love others. And this wise man who was 10 years older than me kept putting his wing around me, meeting me where I was. And, and I wonder, I wonder what did I miss? What did I miss that he was trying to teach me? What did I miss that he was wanting to say to me? What did I miss that in our relationship, as good as it was, that I wasn't ready to receive? When I was like the attendant of the vineyard, God was sending messengers to me in my life, and God sends messengers to all of us, and are we willing to receive what it is they say to us? Or is it a little uncomfortable sometimes? You know, he, he wasn't from my denomination. He was from more of a, a holy roller kind of denomination where they stand up and they shout and they wave their hands and, and you know, let's disciple. We're the frozen chosen. We don't move. <laughs> I speak the truth, right? And sometimes it's uncomfortable for us if somebody comes in among us and they start to raise their hands and they shout. And it's like, ooh. Right? But God put my friend and I together for a reason. And as I reflect this week, I, I see some things in him and I heard some things said about him that, yeah, he was saying to me. And, and I've kind of had to rearrange and maybe grab hold of those seeds again to see if they're, if they're producing fruit. If over the years as the leaves have fallen in my ministry, in my relationship with Jesus, have I heard the words of the messenger of this God sent to my life? Have I allowed the servants to come in and serve me and teach me and grow me? You see, we all have people in our lives who make a difference in our lives and show us who Jesus is. And the question is, are we willing to receive that? Or are we like the chief priests and the verse? God loved him so much, he said, okay, the landowner loved the tenant so much, he said, I'm just going to send my son. And there's a reason he sent his son. Because the culture which Jesus lived in was honor and shame. Every action you did in your life, every action, either brought honor to your family or brought shame to your family. And that's exactly how you were judged. Didn't matter what you did for a living, didn't matter what car you drove, didn't matter what part of town you lived in. What mattered was what you did. And every act you did was either honor or shame. And the quality of your person was defined by the amount of honor or the amount of shame that you brought into this world. So the landowner said, I'll send to my son. They're not going to listen to the messengers, to the slaves that I sent, for they didn't value their witness. But I'll send to my son. I'll send my son to them. He's the heir, and they will respect that out of honor. They will respect the landowner's son. And what did they do? They made a plan to steal, to kill, and to take what was rightfully not theirs. How many of us have had messengers come into our lives? And we hear about Jesus. And we hear about a cornerstone of our faith. And we don't receive that message. We push that message. You know, we may say on here on Sunday, oh yeah, yeah, Jesus. But when we walk out on Monday, we kill the message. We kill the messenger. We act completely opposite of who God expects us to be. We grab everything for ourselves. And we say, this world is about me. And do you know what a building looks like when you don't have a cornerstone? I know there's some engineers in the congregation. And I can't imagine a building being built without a cornerstone to go from. I have a friend, he's passed since also. And he was a different kind of mentor in my life. He was kind of crazy. But he built a patio on his back house and kind of enclosed an outdoor patio and had an awning and he decided he was going to build a room out of it. 
I don't think he used a level. I don't think he used a plumb line. I don't think they were the crookedest, most unsquare walls I've ever. I don't know how he got it together. He had to cover up gaps with sheetrock. He had to because those walls were the crookedest. Cra he didn't use any sense of a cornerstone. And we all talked to him. We went over there while he was framing it. It's not going to work. He made it work, <laughs> but it was ugly. <laughs> Every time I looked at it, my carpenter's eye was just like, oh my gosh, how can you do that? How often do we look at ourselves and say, oh my gosh, how can you do that? You've forgotten what the messenger said to you. You've forgotten who your cornerstone is. You've forgotten that from which you live. Everything in your life is about living from a cornerstone. Jesus even quotes Psalm 118. And he says, they will send the sun and they will, the stone upon which the builders reject will become the capstone. Do you know what the capstone is? Once they get two, two or three layers of the wall up, they, they place a big stone in the corner and that solidifies the angle they're working from. They have the cornerstone they start with, and then as they build up a little bit, they put a capstone in there, and that solidifies the angle and helps them stay on track so that everything goes straight up that's plumb and perpendicular the way it's supposed to be, and that the angles stay correct. And so what, what Jesus says to the chief priests and the Pharisees is, you rejected the stone. And God took that stone, just like he said he would from the psalmist. And he's made it the capstone. He's going to make it the capstone. The kingdom of God will be built from the capstone. The cornerstone of our life. And that is Jesus. What do you think the landowner would do to the tenants? They asked. Jesus asked the question. What do you think in this situation? Where the tenants have lived from selfishness, self-righteousness. The tenants have claimed what is not theirs for their own. What do you think the landowner is going to do to them? What happens when we deny Christ? Do we lose our salvation? No. We are saved by grace through faith, says Paul. We all believe that. But when we walk away from who it is Jesus is calling us to be, who it is our relationship with Jesus is forming us to be, what happens? What happens? God gives that your opportunities of witness to somebody else. To somebody else. How many times have you seen an opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with somebody and you chose not to? Simple little ways. A hug. And I know it's dangerous these days. A hug. A greeting. A chance to help somebody who needs help. A chance to be a witness to somebody else who's walking through the same paths as you. My friend met me where I was and walked with me. He didn't have to. His church was successful. Mine was struggling and growing and, and, and do, starting to do well. We didn't have to partner on things. But he continued to sow seeds in my life to help me understand what it means to represent Jesus to all people. What it means to seize opportunities. We both loved bird dogs. And he had a beautiful kennel full of bird dogs. I went and visited one day, and I went home with two pups. She wasn't that happy, but that's the way I am. He was sowing seeds into my life so that we could build a relationship outside the church. So that I could see that he was the same man outside the church that he was inside the church. That the witness outside the church is just is not more important than the witness inside the church. Especially for those of us who lead people. He was a great, great witness to me. And I've often wondered, did I catch all the things that were said? 
This week I reflected, did I catch all those things? Did I hear all those things? And the Lord keeps sending one thing to me. To never forget the cornerstone. When you talk to my friend, all he wanted to talk about was Jesus. When he preached a sermon, all he preached about was Jesus. When he talked about being loved by God, he talked about a relationship with Jesus and who Jesus was. September 13, fighting a, a battle with cancer. He walks into his church, barely able to move, and he preaches his last sermon to his congregation. And he reminds them who Jesus is as the great physician in their lives. To his dying day, he wanted nothing more than to plant seeds. So that they would grow into fruition. And I've read and I've read and I've read all the different comments about people who have been affected by this man's life. Because he knew his cornerstone. He knew who he was and he knew who God was shaping him to be. You see, the landowner didn't send the slaves into the vineyard to collect the dinero. To collect the money. To collect the profits. You didn't hear that. The scripture says. The landowner sent the tenants. Into the vineyard. To collect the fruits. Do you hear me? God doesn't care. About how much money we make. God doesn't care. About what car we drive. God doesn't care about what we're thought about in society. God cares about the fruit we produce in our lives. The fruit we produce. Because we are children of the Most High King. We have been saved by grace through faith. And we stand on the cornerstone of Jesus as our Savior. And God wants nothing more for us than to walk in faith. To be people who tend the vineyard and yet produce the fruit. And we give the fruit out to all those we encounter. Just recently, I watched someone walk away. They were walking from this very building. And they stopped. And they bent down and they picked up a red leaf. And they looked at that red leaf. And I wondered, do they know the fruit? Are they thinking about the fruit of their life? Are they thinking about the fruit that God's produced in their life this year? Are they thinking about the intimacy they have with the one who grew the tree that dropped the leaf? Everywhere we go, we have an opportunity to produce fruit. We have an opportunity to stand on our cornerstone. And no matter what angle we go in life, wherever we go in life, it's from that cornerstone we go. My friend is no longer in pain. My friend is where he's always wanted to be. My friend has seen Jesus face to face. And he left me with a gift. A reflection of the cornerstone which he stood upon. I was young and a, a man had passed away and my friend was doing the service at his church, but he was a community leader, and we all know him. And I went to his service. And my friend delivered a beautiful eulogy. That's what we do. He delivered a beautiful eulogy. And as he said those lines that I often borrow, today we give thanks to God for this life of blah, 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 and the witness they bear, the legacy they leave. I immediately began to covet because my friend broke out in the most beautiful tenor voice. And from his cornerstone, he produced the fruit of a beautiful, angelic voice that he was known for. And he sang from his heart the song, Sweet You the Lamb. I didn't like him from that moment on. <laughs> I loved him. Because from his very being, the fruit of the kingdom of God flowed, not only in words, but in music. I pray he rests in peace. I pray he celebrates the kingdom in which he lives now. 
but I also pray that we, the people of God, stand on our cornerstone and reflect the fruit which we have been given so that we can share it with others we love. And that from now on, Jesus is our cornerstone and God is the harvester of the fruit. Amen. Amen. Amen.